Good evening and welcome to Montpelier Civic Forum. This is a special edition on the reopening. Basically, town meeting is not coming, but we have an election coming up on August 11th. Please watch the show with John Odom, where he discusses not only the primary election, but the election in the fall. That is an extremely important show. We have other shows. We have Ann Watson speaking about the city's reopening. We have Bill Fraser talking about the city's reopening from the budgetary and operational perspective. We have Dan Groberg discussing the downtown businesses. We have Carolyn Brennan discussing the Kellogg Hubbard Library. And a very, very interesting show on the final day of Chief Tony Fakos and the first week of Chief Brian Pete, we have the two chiefs together and they discuss policing policy, community-based policing, and it's an extremely interesting show that presents our police department from the policy perspective. Now today, we have a, another special show. We are addressing policing again, but we're addressing it from the perspective of the actual line policeman and how policing is done. And we have two very, very special people we have Corporal Mike Philbrick here, and we have our school resource officer, Diane Matthews. Welcome to Montpelier Civic Forum, to both of you. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Richard. Mike, what does a corporal do? Uh, it's a form of first-line supervisor. It's kind of a, a funny gray area where it's a cross between a senior, a senior police officer and a, a sergeant or a, a supervisor. So we have the um, the role of a supervisor and we can run a shift um, if a sergeant is not present but we also will work regular patrol hours um, as a patrol officer so it's kind of a hybrid between a regular officer and a supervisor. Now you were and are what the kids would call the cop on the bike? Yeah I've been a bike officer for several years and our uh, ability to field officers on bikes just depends on staffing, weather um, and then obviously with the recent COVID-19 um, situation. Um, it's been safer for officers to be isolated in vehicles and, and not be uh, out and about riding a bike with a mask on. What's the theory behind the, off the bicycle officer? I mean, it's exactly the opposite of what I just said, is to get officers out of the car and into the community. Um, you know, when you're wearing shorts and a polo shirt, a lot of times you're more approachable. You're on a bike, you know, a lot of people will come up to you and talk to you about your bicycle or um, there'll be another cyclist in traffic next to you and you'll end up having a conversation um, just because of the fact that you're riding a bike. But generally, it's, you know, it's a, a softer approach. It's, it's an officer that's out in the community, available, not surrounded by a steel cage. Um, and so it's just a much more positive and easier to approach um, you know, duty or, or, or situation for our officers and for the community. Now, the bicycle officer's been along around here for a long time. And I know this for a fact. Sure. So I, Tony Fakos was a bicycle officer Absolutely. at one time. And he's been a big supporter of the program. Um, you know, it, it's not easy to you know, send an officer to a training course for 40 hours and, and, and provide that funding and time in addition to the, the additional equipment. Um, but you know, it does end up, I think, saving money in the long run with you know, reduced uh, emissions and gas usage from vehicles. and some increased um, health options or, you know, it makes the officers healthier to get the exercise during the shift in addition to all the benefits um, of being out in the community. What's the 40 hours of training to be a bicycle officer? Um, so there's two different programs that are national, nationally based. Um, one is called the Law Enforcement Bicycle Association, LIBA, and the other is IPIMBA, the International Police Mountain Bike Association. So there's two organizations that provide training for officers, um, police officers who are going to be uh, riding, riding bicycles, you know, at, at work. Um, they provide extra training, you know, everything from conditioning and, and health and maintenance of the bicycle um, to defensive tactics with a bicycle, using the bike to, um, you know, defend yourself if, if uh, somebody were to attack you or, um, you know, just learning to ride it with the equipment on, things like that. Have you ever chased anyone down on the bike? Uh, I attempted to chase a vehicle once. Um, then when I was dog chases car. When I was very yeah, when I was very it was very early on in my career, and I'd first been certified. It was pretty um, uh, energetic and maybe a little overzealous. Um, but there was a, a vehicle that I tried to stop, and another officer in a, in a car had to end up stopping it. But I was able to to keep it in view long enough 
um, for another officer in a vehicle to get there. Speaking of equipment and all, um, no, your, your vision is not wrong. The police that are on today are wearing bulletproof vests. Can you explain why? I mean, it's part of our, um, you know, it's part of policy for us to wear the protective vest when we're working and in, in public. I'm sure there's a, you know, a liability aspect to that, but it's also ensures that we're safe and that we feel safe um, when we're interacting and working um, sometimes in dangerous situations. Diane, uh, in the schools, the resource officer wears the vest? Yes, at this time we do. Wear full uniform. Uh, it's a different type of vest. It's underneath of a polo shirt, so it's less like a uniform on the outside. Like a softer approach. And khaki pants. How uncomfortable is the vest? How warm is it? I mean, they're very warm in the, uh, in the, in the wintertime. It's something you get used to. Yeah. The school resource officer, what's the theory behind that program? Having an officer in the schools, we have four in our supervisory union um, to be able four to- Four schools, not four police resource officers. Correct, yep. Four schools, one officer. Um, to be able to interact with children on a day-to-day -day basis, create a community feel where we're approachable, be able to get to know the students, be able to get to know the staff in the school, uh, administration in the school, help them out with uh, any type of issues they might foresee happening with the children, and just have a, an easier time interacting with children because you see them every day. Kind of like community policing. If you're always out in the community, you're more approachable. It would be the same in the schools. If a student were to approach a teacher and say that they've been assaulted by a family member. The teacher has a legal responsibility to report that. Is the legal responsibility to report it to the school resource officer, to the principal, to children's services? How does that play out? So they're mandated reporters, just like we are. They need to report it to DCF within 24 hours. DCF um, being? Uh, the Children and Family Services. So they need to do that. Frequently, they'll be referred by DCF to their local police department or just take the intake information and go from there, depending on what information was relayed to uh, When they services. go to the local police department, who do they go to? When, it, when a child, when a student is involved, who does it go to? Does it go to one... A, person who's a peer of yours or peer of yours, or does it come back to you? Depends, I think, I would say on the time of day and the circumstances. Um, in my experience, we've had DCF essentially contact us in the evening and say, this report has come in, we need you to investigate it. And so we would then respond to the re residents and interact with the family and there'd be a DCF worker there with us. Um, and we essentially would conduct an investigation to determine what had occurred and if, um, you know, the, the, the child needs medical attention, if the, you know, the, the child needs to be potentially removed from the residence, depending on the circumstances, and placed in state custody. Um, what's called the CHENS, or a child in need of services, um, but that's a pretty extreme circumstance. Um, but that's generally the, the procedure, is that once they would receive a report from a mandated reporter, then DCF would generally approach the law enforcement agency. Um, I imagine that during the day, if it were it came in during the day, and you know, it was the child was in the school, then the school resource officer would likely take that um, that case. Um, and that's one of the benefits of having the SRO there is that they generally have, in, in our experience, have built you know good relationships with both the kids in the school, but also their families. So whether it's an incident like this, where there's a specific allegation of of, of harm, you know, essentially a domestic situation excuse me, situation, or it's just simply something where officers in the middle of the night are interacting with a family um, or, or a child for whatever reason, a lot of times that school resource officer, because of their existing relationship, because they had the chance to build those relationships with the children and their families, has been a huge advantage because, you know, the kids are comfortable with, you know, with officer, you know, you know, after Officer Matt or Officer Diane or whoever is in the school at the time, now Matt Nisley was our um, last school resource officer. Um, and so either them being more comfortable, 
interacting with them, um, just generally whether we just happen to show up at their house or it's in the school, um, or if it's, you know, a, a, we have a call late at night where we go to somebody's residence, there's a family or a kid there, um, and we've been able to contact um, the school resource officer after hours and say, hey, what do, you, you know, what do you know about this kid and his family? Can you give us some background, some history, you know, so we can understand maybe there's, you know, other, other situations, there's other aspects going on, whether it be, um, you know, developmental issues or, or mental health issues or, or just family stuff or, you know, tr you know, troubles with other children at school. A lot of times that information can be really helpful uh, when we're interacting with a, a family. Child Tr suddenly becomes acting out, starts acting out in school. That could go along with that too. Now, what is the difference in school between a fight, a fight between two boys, and an assault? What you know? What when does a fight become an assault, and when does a fight become something <coughs> that engages our police system? Well, an assault. To me, they're, they're one and the same. It's degrees of an assault. And whether or not they're fighting with each other or if it's one person on, or you're talking about children specifically, correct? Yeah, I'm, I'm talking two high school students. Yep. So the traditional one, fight between boys in high school. If it's one child fighting with the other and the other one isn't part of the fight or are they fighting with each other and need to separate them? And, and that would be a good reason for a school resource officer to be on hand, to be able to separate them where school, people in the school, administration, teachers, they have a limited amount of hands-on that they can do. They have different types of techniques for separating people. And to be able to have law enforcement there to say, you know, this is beyond just two kids pushing each other. It's an investigation like anything else, but to be able to get the history from the teachers, have they fought before? Are they in classes together? All that information would come together with that as well. Does that ever become criminal in the juvenile justice system? Uh, I'm sure it could, yeah. They also have their own restorative justice system in place in the school, like we do in town, the, the um, restorative justice center. Uh, Mike, what's the Restorative Justice Center? Uh, so I think the official name is the Community Justice Center, but it's a restorative justice program where um, a variety of different types of conflicts can be diverted either from the criminal justice system or just generally, you know, in the case of like a neighbor dispute um, where they, they would offer mediation, um, but it's a, a great alternative um, to placing, you know, whether it be juveniles or adults into the criminal justice system. A lot of times we'll take, as we do with every situation, we, use our, we can use our discretion to take into account all of the circumstances involved in a situation. A lot of times we'll decide that, you know, whether it's somebody who's a, you know, a first-time offender or there's other mitigating factors, um, we can refer them to the community justice center, either us directly as officers, um, or other, you know, private citizens can approach the community justice center or the courts can refer them, refer, refer a case back to the Community Justice Center um, so that they, you know, so that the uh, people, the parties involved in the incident um, can have the issue addressed um, through a restorative process versus through, through a, a criminal or penal process. Um, and that can involve um, you know, the parties writing letters to each other, that can involve mediation face-to-face generally with the goal of having the aggrieved party be made whole um, and have their um, feelings and the effects on them acknowledged by the, the perpetrator of whatever, that, whatever the incident may be, you know, whether it's something very minor or something more significant. Um, and that could be more impactful than a penal punishment. Are you a formal part of that in the schools? Or are you just informally called in when circumstances merit their, their version of restorative justice? The school resource officer can be a part of that, referring to, you mean rather referring to their restorative justice rather Exactly. Than <laughs> yes, yep, certainly inside the school. Does that work in the elementary school as well as the middle and high um, school? That I can't tell you, I don't, okay. I'm not aware of that at this point. In terms of drugs at the high school, it's against the law. Mm -hmm. um, at what point 
does it become criminal? Is that a, a school referral? Is that, you know, uh, Johnny is caught with pot on him at the high school. What it's happens? It's diversion. It, it goes to diversion so first. So it's essentially a restorative justice process. So In marijuana, because it's decriminalized, you know, basically it's, it's not decriminalized for children. Correct. Correct. So that's why there is a, essentially a ticket, a civil ticket would be the penalty. Um, you know, I think it's something like a $300 fine. Mm -hmm. If they don't go through diversion. So they have to complete a diversion process or pay the ticket. Right. So, in, so initially, so essentially we would, you know, take the complaint or, or, or detect the, the issue, you know, somebody's smoking marijuana on school grounds. And again, there may be a response from the school, a discipline, disciplinary response from the school for that. But if there, you know, the school resource officer were to locate somebody smoking marijuana or an officer out, um, you know, on regular patrol, then we would essentially interact with the student or the, or the, the, the juvenile, you know, uh, whatever they had would be... Um, um, you know, taken and disposed of, and then they'd be issued diversion paperwork. And so it's essentially a slip of paper that explains the process. We write down the ticket number on it, we write down our information on it, and then they're referred to Washington County Diversion. Um, and that may, that, and then they're required to go through essentially a restorative process where that would be something like, I imagine with that type of thing, it would be an educational process where they'd be required to attend some sort of course um, and learn about the effects of you know, marijuana on everything from brain development to operation of a motor vehicle. Um, and if they complete that satisfactor you know, satisfactorily, then uh, the ticket goes away. Jane was involved in shoplifting, and it goes through the system, and Jane has to go through the restorative justice. Does that get to you at the school? Do you know, does the school know that Jane was involved in shoplifting? Is there a connection between school and city systems. I don't think that if a, I mean, there's something of a criminal nature that a juvenile is involved in. I don't think the school is automatically informed. But you it, mean information shared with the school? Exactly. Do, do they know that Jane is having problems outside of school? I don't think there's not like an automatic process. I think that again, having a, a school, resource officer, school resource officer present in the school would allow that sort of information to be shared so that school resources, in addition to the officer, other school resources could come to bear to help, the, help, you know, help that child, whether that be counseling or other things. Um, you know, is it you know, uh, a socioeconomic thing where the, the family doesn't have, doesn't have a lot of money so the child feels like they have to go and steal the things that they want? Um, you know, there's any number of positives of sharing that information, but if it's something significant that doesn't really involve the school, then it's you know it's a, a sort of a of a private criminal nature, especially as a juvenile. Those types of records are sealed. Staying with juveniles, um, the long tradition of juveniles in um, Hubbard Park after after dark. What's the police presence in Hubbard Park during the day and and after dark? Well, we used to close the gate at nine o'clock, <coughs> have the gate locked. Uh, we haven't been asked to do that this year, and honestly, we haven't had calls out at night to Hubbard Park this year. We generally do a patrol, a few patrols through there during the evening, just to make sure people aren't out there parking, doing things they shouldn't be doing, um, making sure nobody's broken down up there and, and in, in trouble that way, needing a ride out of there. Um, but lost, as far lost as on the trails, um, you those know, I mean, types of things. You know, there's any number of issues that come from the different park areas, but generally Hubbard Park doesn't create a lot of issues. Usually a lot of the complaints we get there are with dogs. Mm -hmm. What happens when you get a, a dog complaint? Usually that's after the fact, well mm -hmm. after the fact. What happens? What, how are dog complaints in the park dealt with? I mean, the, the city, uh, city um, council just recently re essentially rewrote the dog ordinance to help clarify the process um, to where if a dog is in, you know, if a dog owner is in violation of, you know, having a, a dog at large, um, which uh, there's a, a kind of a two, two prongs of, of that in Montpelier where in the downtown area and on public youth paths and sidewalks, dogs are required to be on leashes now. Whereas at Hubbard Park, they just need to be under, under, under voice command and under control. And so usually the, 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 like the largest complaint we usually get are, you know, dogs that will you know they're overly friendly or or aggressive in some way towards another dog or towards an, uh, towards a human, um, 
you know, some people will call and say, oh, this dog charged me, jumped on me, um, or oh, this dog, you know, came at my dog and they got into Does it. Does that go and, into mediation or? Um, so yeah, so there are different level, again, with a lot of other things, we have a lot of discretion, but there are different levels um, where with the, a first violation of a dog at large or, you know, a, a, a new, you know all the way up to a, a dog being declared nu a nuisance and removed from the city, you know, we go from essentially a verbal warning to removal of the dog from the city, basically where the, the dog's owner would be told, and this has to go through a certain process with the city council, um, the dog would be told the dog has to be removed and it can't, can't be within the city limits. Um, but restorative justice, um, the, the community justice center has, that's a big part of, of what they would, a type of, the type of um, incident they would handle. I would imagine, and this is just simply me, that the toughest thing for you to deal with as police is a domestic dispute. Certainly one of the most dangerous. Dangerous in what sense? I mean, it's, if you think about it, it's a situation that has gotten so bad that somebody essentially who cares or loves about somebody else was willing to call the police to make them stop. Um, that they were so afraid or, or something had happened so bad um, that or they, were over, they were able to overcome, you know, essentially not wanting their, their significant other to get in trouble to call us to come and help them. There's um, so frequently children involved. There's frequently children on the scene. There's a lot of emotion. It's a lot of passion. Um, and okay, a lot of you times, two are driving up in a, in a police car. A neighbor is called, mm -hmm. heard yelling and, and just commotion in the household, or you've gotten a, one person on a cell phone saying, I'm, I feel threatened. They've called 911, what happens? When that call comes in <laughs> from my wife, First he's out of control. What, what happens at that, that point that they've called 911? First, we get information from our dispatchers if we've been out to that residence before. Is there a background of that type of thing going on so we're prepared? Is this something that just happened out of the blue? Is this... If there's a history, then we can get some data. We can get information about what has happened in the past. Mm -hmm. um, who are we dealing with? Has there been, have there been drugs involved? Has there been alcohol involved? Um, you know, which really affect people's behavior. Um, now they bring weapons, you know, things. Now you have no idea whether there's a weapon inside our house. We don't, but a lot, that's, that's, that's questions that our dispatchers are trained to ask. So, you know, say, is, you know, is, the, is that per, the person you're calling about, are they intoxicated? You know, which a lot of times can lead to more violent erratic behavior, um, you know, a diminishing of, of um, um, you know, their inhibitions about any number of things. So that'd be from language to, to physical violence. Um, and then obviously if there are weapons, you know, there's a firearm, or if the person attacked the other person with a knife, or if it was just, um, you know, with, with fists or shoving or, or, or something, or just verbal abuse, um, you know, we get all spectrum of calls, and it can, it can span very widely at any time. What um, if there is a weapon in the house? What, uh, when you're approaching the door, there is a weapon in the house, it's commotion, you can't sort out the emotion, What's the initial approach besides saying we are, you know, I am such and such from the police department, Montpelier Police Department? I mean, we, we want to have that information before we arrive, and if we know that a weapon's been involved, I mean, we basically would try to get both parties to come out, you know, unarmed with their hands empty. Um, That's if the weapon's involved. What if the right. weapon is in a lockbox or, or just in the house somewhere? Yeah, they just tell them to leave it there, and, you know, we, we, we essentially approach as you know, as, as, tactically, as, as tactically as we could, where we're gonna, you know, try to make, make sure that we're as safe as possible. We'll arrive quietly, you know, we'll walk up maybe from a distance away, um, not, you know, not come screaming up lights and sirens, like you maybe, maybe you would see on TV, um, so that we feel safer and we can get as much information as possible, we'll give our dispatch time to get us whatever information they have, but we'll also walk up and listen, you know, sit outside in the So you, know, you want the both parties outside? Not necessarily, but it certainly can be, especially that's something we've started to um, use with COVID is instead of going into a residence where, right. you, know, every, you know, everything from, you know, the whole, you know, the breathing thing with masks and stuff like that, it's, everything's more concentrated. You know, we've changed our, our procedure to have people come out of a residence regardless of what the situation is. Are um, you in avoid, masks? To avoid infection. Yeah, we always wear masks as a matter of policy when we're in public. Um, just like the vest to protect ourselves and protect uh, the public. Um, but, you know, we're essentially trying to collect as much information as possible before we get there. Obviously, if there's you know, an emergent situation where we can hear somebody, somebody being assaulted, then we're going to you know, move in and deal with that as quickly as possible. 
but a lot of times, in the majority of the times, in my experience, what has happened has happened, and now we're just doing an investigation. You know, the, the dispatcher tells, okay, the parties are separated. Um, there's no drugs or alcohol involved. There, there are no weapons. Um, and so we'll come up, you know, listen for a little bit, see what's going on, knock on the door, separate the two parties, have an officer speak with one, one part, one group, have another officer speak with another group, and there would probably be multiple officers present regardless because of how dangerous it can be. Um, and the other officers will either just kind of observe and monitor the situation I, or talk to other witnesses. Now, you have to get out there fairly quickly. You know, mm -hmm. something, something possibly bad has happened. Certainly something with the potential of being bad has happened. Absolutely. What happens in the middle of the night? How many officers are on night shift in the middle of the night? So it varies to the time of day. I mean, uh, during the day, we could have quite a few officers on between the regular patrol officers and a patrol supervisor to a school resource officer and our detectives, um, as well as a captain and a chief. Um, so you can see that there, even if the, you know, the chief and the captain or these other officers aren't, um, you know, driving around patrolling or responding to regular calls for service, they're still available to come, you know, to a significant incident. Frequently overnight, we call on other agencies. Maybe Berlin, a Berlin unit might be available and they come back us up and just kind of hang in the background and help us out if, if it's needed, just to be a presence and be able to help us do our job. And yeah, make sure that, because a large part of, you know, officers, uh, the bigger question of like officers use of force is making sure, you know, just like when we, if we wear our vests or we have other tools and equipment, the, the safer the officer feels, um, the, the less likely that we are to use force. Mm -hmm. um, so somebody, you know, some places may say, well, why are there four officers at, at, you know, at that house? Okay, well, it's because it came in as a, a verbal domestic that, you know, we know there's history there that has escalated to violence in the past. So in order for us to ensure that everybody on scene is safe and we feel safe, we may go initially with multiple officers. Um, but to go back to your original question, um, so during the day, obviously, there's a lot, a lot of resources available because that's just kind of, you know, the, the way people are scheduled, especially in the administration and investigations. Um, and then in the evening, we'll typically have between three and four officers on shift. And then after midnight, it'll vary to, until like, you know, uh, six or eight, seven or eight in the morning, depending on other officer schedules, um, we'll have between two and three. So in the middle of the night, you know, you may, ha you may, we may only have two officers to respond. And then there are other agencies around the area that aren't 24 hours, including the state police. The state police go off duty at 2 a.m. Um, so in the middle of the night at, say, like 5 in the morning, um, we may only have Barry City to call on or Barry Town or Berlin. And Berlin and Barry Town may only have one officer on. So that officer may be tied up. You know, Barry City only has two officers on. So you can see that our resources at different times of the day may be um, more limited. And so we're going to be more cautious um, during those times. You separate. What does separating mean? Does that mean that one of them is going to spend the night somewhere else or, or spend some time physically somewhere else so that they are allowed to cool it off? Frequently. That's frequently what happens, especially it's, if it's a verbal. It's in the short term during the investigation when we arrive at the residence, but it's also in the long term. A lot of times it's just generally better to say, like, you know, if, if it didn't rise maybe to the physical level or to a criminal level, uh, we may seek to see, okay, you have, you have somewhere where you can go so that this doesn't happen again or so things don't escalate. Um, but also in the initial, during the initial investigation, we wanted to separate folks so that we can get both parties' um, statements and their take of what, what occurred without it kind of bleeding over into the, each other's stories, you know, because um, everybody's going to have a different perspective. And so if you interview two people in the same room at the same time, then they can feed off each other, you know, just as we can talk back and forth and, and contribute to the questions you're asking us when we're conducting an investigation. Um, we want just your take, you know, just the victim's take, just the, the dominant aggressor's take. At what point might a women's shelter come into this? We almost always bring up um, CIRCLE. Uh, I don't know what that is. Which is our local organization. The that, acronym for it. Um, this predominantly supports um, female victims of domestic violence. And we pretty much always <coughs> refer them to that group because we don't know what the level is between the aggressor and the victim. What the history is. I mean, even if it's something minor, even if it's, you know, two people who are sitting in a, in a parking lot, you know, at a supermarket and they're getting an argument, somebody calls and we, we arrive and we may talk to them and find out that they're arguing about, you know, finances or something, you know. 
uh, relatively insignificant that led to an argument that caught somebody's attention and somebody was concerned, we may still refer them to, or, you know, it's something we do, we're kind of a clearinghouse for information and services, um, or whether it's a domestic situation or a dog situation, we may, um, you know. They might not know what's out there and they don't know who to ask. Right. Diane, you had spoken about children being around. Mm -hmm. Is children's services notified? Yes, we're mandated reporters like the teachers are. Um, we need to call, and we, we call after hours frequently, we call Division of Family Services, Children and Family Services, just to tell them what we saw and what happened. We give them the children's information as well. How old were the kids? What was the proximity of the children um, while this was going on? Were they in the room? Was one of the parents holding one of the children as it was happening? They need to know those things and then they make their determination whether or not they're going to do their own investigation. So this might go on for, even if the parents feel it's over, it's not over. Because the children are in, impacted in ways that people don't even realize. What happens if the two of them say, wait a second, this is getting out of control, you know, this, it, we don't want this to be a criminal thing, and you do want it to be a criminal thing. It's not, what their, it's not their choice. If we see clear signs of um, an assault that's happened, or it's it's not their choice to say, "I don't." Okay, I'm done. We're not. I don't want you to. I don't do want to press charges. Uh, that's something we hear a lot. But in Vermont, it's the state that presses charges, not the individual. So mm -hmm. even if we have an uncooperative victim, we could still proceed with the case, although it may be slightly more difficult. And that's not uncommon in a domestic situation. Like I alluded to in the beginning, um, there's a lot of emotion there. You know, if you have just called the, you know, your partner has just done something so, you know, so bad that scared you so badly or hurt you so badly that you called the police for help, you know, our main goal is to go in and make sure everybody's safe in the short term. Um, and in that process, it's, it's, you know, it's not uncommon for our victim who called us to change, to totally change their attitude or their story, and even, even become... Uh, either you know verbally aggressive or physically aggressive towards us, you know, as soon as we make you know in our attention known to maybe arrest that maybe arrest their partner um, or their family member. So that's why it can be such a dangerous situation. You're not just dealing with one perpetrator of a crime; you're dealing with an entire family unit potentially that is emotionally obviously attached to each other. And when we when we decide to take an action as a result of that. Um, whether in the, in the you know, immediate situation where maybe we're going to put the handcuffs on somebody and take them into custody, it's not uncommon for that you know, for person who's formerly the victim or other family members to, you know, to intercede physically. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can have other forms where they'll recant their, state, you know, they'll recant their statement later on. So it's, it's a very complicated situation, and that's why it can and be... And a volatile situation. Right, and that's why it can be so dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, so. What happens, I've had this fight with my wife. There is a firearm present. It wasn't brandished in, in the dispute. <coughs> is firearm taken away? It's a possibility. There's a, a recent change in the law that allows officers to remove firearms um, from a residence of somebody who's been charged with a domestic assault. Um, there's also another form of an uh, what is it, an emergency, I'm trying to remember what it's called. I'm sorry, it's basically called it's basically it's an emergency order that a judge can grant in right. in, in line with a, you know a restraining order, but it essentially is an emergency order that allows a judge to require that some of these firearms be taken away because there's a risk to themselves or others as a result. Would that uh, the request for that writ be done quickly? It can be, and again, with the recent change in the law, um, as I, you know, as part of our training, we have a domestic violence refresher each year that we're required to take because it's such a large, um, such a significant type of call that we deal with. Um, we work hard to receive training every year and be updated, and that was part of the update this year was that in those situations where somebody is arrested for domestic assault, we can immediately remove the firearms from the residence if we have cause. Diane, what happens when you've observed me and, and I just don't look mentally stable at that point in time? Will mental health officials be called in? We work with Washington County Mental Health frequently and we will call them and have a screener. With the current situation, the screener frequently 
is on the phone with the individual. Lots of times the person doesn't want to interact with a screener and we explain to them, well, you could go to the hospital and speak with a screener or you could speak with them on the phone, but we really feel like you're not safe. If it's a safety situation where it's self-harm or they're harming others, we definitely get Washington County Mental Health involved. We're really fortunate in Washington County to have them as a full-time agency. They're available 24 hours a day. You know, with the recent conversations about you know, moving responsibilities from police to other agencies, we do have some of those resources right now, but again, it's like countywide. So, and again, you come down to staffing, where in the middle of the night at four in the morning, there may be one screener on, and they may be dealing with something in Berry City. And so that, you know, that sort of ties our hands as to what we can do. If there's exigency where the person is a, you know, in crisis and a really significant harm or, or possibility of harm to themselves or others, then, you know, we may end up having to take action, like taking the person into protective custody or, or at least staying with them wherever they may be, where we've been called to in order to ensure their safety and the public safety. And so that would be something that we would like to see. Um, I know that there's uh, in the works as a, you know, a, uh, a street level interventionist, a, uh, um, the social worker. Yeah, our, is coming so in. the social worker that we're going to be Barry sharing. Barry in Vermont sharing. Barry sharing with, and, and right. Montpelier sharing. They'll be sharing with Barry City. Um, I understand the intention is to have them be able to respond, to be riding essentially with us and have them be able to respond with us or to other areas, I guess, between here and Barry. Um, and to be able to be there specifically, which would be an incredible asset, um, because you know we are not we are not mental health professionals. We leave we we receive a lot of training on how to interact with people in crisis and people in altered mental states and um, and with a variety of of uh, physical and mental ailments. Um, so we're well versed in training. We understand how how to interact with those people, but. Um, we do not have the ability to, you know, write a mental health warrant and have them taken against their will into um, treatment. You know, we can essentially be the, again, be that clearinghouse, be the um, the organization that provides them with the resource. Sometimes we're called by Washington County Mental Health to do a welfare check on someone that they're already familiar with. What does a welfare check involve? Maybe the agency can't get a hold of that person, or that person says some things that make them think they're going to do self-harm or they've just disappeared, not shown up for an appointment, then they're asking us to go out and make sure that person is okay. We'll check their residence, their known residence. Uh, if we can't find them there, we'll dig a little bit deeper and try to get an idea. Do they go to work? Can we check their, their vehicle? Do they drive? Uh, where do they frequent? Just to kind of get a beat on them and ask them, how are you doing? We, we were asked to do a welfare check on you because Washington County Mental Health said, you said this and this. How are you feeling now? And sometimes we transport them up to the hospital to speak with Washington County Mental Health or, or do a check-in and get a little deeper into that. <clears throat> this is one of the benefits of, of having a full-time agency like Washington County Mental Health and others that, you know, it's not, it's not like every mental health crisis is new. Like, a lot of people suffer from mental illness, they receive treatment, they have caretakers or caseworkers through WCMH or other agencies that are regularly interacting with them. And so they get to kind of know their baseline. Um, and us as police officers on the street get to interact with them on a regular basis as well. So we get to know a lot of the, the folks that we are interacting with in our community who have mental illness. You know, somebody may not know the, you know, in passing, you may live in Montpelier and not know who all these people are. You may just see them walking on the street or, or um, somewhere else, but we get to know them. And so somebody will call and say, oh, this person is, you know, it's a, it's a, a female that's screaming and, and sort of, you know, self-flagellating, like, you know, hitting herself. Oh, that's so-and-so. We know that's, that's, that's her behavior. That's her typical behavior. And that's her description. Um, that's usually how she is. So, okay. We know her. So, you know, I mean, okay, you know, she doesn't react well to a police presence. So maybe we would seek out having mental health, either we wait, wait, wait to make contact with her until mental health can be with us or just let mental health know that what's going on and they'll interact with her without us. Um, and so we, we do have a lot of these resources available already um, and having that, having the, you know, the relationship, our, the already existing relationship with some of these community members is such a benefit because obviously their behavior is alarming enough um, or concerning enough to other community members to where they would call us. Um, but it, it, you know, we're able to triage it kind of and, and, and be able to determine if it doesn't really require a police response. Um, and that's, again, a big part of the, the current conversation going on, that we're already 
you know, kind of doing. That's a segue to alcoholism, which is a segue to drunk driving. Sure. Um, do you guys know drunk dri chronic drunk drivers and keep your eyes out for them? Or is that violating uh, an issue <coughs> of, of personal privacy? Well, I could tell you before the current situation with COVID, when um, the bars would be open, we would do regular bar checks and stop in and we might know someone who can't drive because they have charges against them and they'll talk about, yeah, I'm walking up the street after we regularly interact with some people like that. Um, I think the, right now it's hard to, to interact with people regularly Yeah, the interpersonal, like that. that's one of, my, one of my favorite and most rewarding parts of the job is the interpersonal relationships with the community. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we may, you know, we don't develop relationships, yeah, with the people that, that we interact with who are uh, maybe being charged with something or, or who are suffering from mental illness or, or who are in crisis. Um, but there's also a lot of normal relationships that we develop, you know, whether that's, like Diane said, you know, walking to a bar in the evening, you know, just to make sure that, you know, everything's calm, and especially if it's like the holidays or it's a really busy time um, where there's a lot of, um, you know, drunk driving or a lot of behavioral issues. I um, mean, you know, alcohol is probably one of the worst drugs um, as far as behavioral issues. Um, you know, or it, you know, you're on day shift walking around and going to get your, your, just to get your lunch at a, a sandwich shop. I mean, you know, you having those normal interactions are I think really important to us as officers because if we don't have those, then all we're doing is responding to really negative situations, which can take its toll on us. Including relationships with transient population because they're the people who are out frequently in the same places every day. And we interact with them on a regular basis, whether that's because of their own behavior or because somebody else calls us, or we just see them in passing. I mean, I know Diana sat down with a lot of our transient population and just chatted with them for like up to like two hours. Yeah. Um, just to, and it's great, you know, not everybody wants to do that and not everybody's able to do that, but some people have the disposition like Diane does. Um, and it's been a huge um, advantage, just like a school resource officer can get to know the kids in the school or the families, having somebody or, or those officers who get to know the folks that we interact with on a regular basis. Again, it's like somebody calls about somebody drinking in public or urinating in public. Oh, we know who that is. We'll, we'll, we'll talk with them later. Um, you know, we need, we don't we're a small to, town. Yeah, we are a small town, but even if it were a larger city, I mean, whether, you know, our beat happens to be an entire town. Other departments may have you know, officers assigned to different areas. And, you, you know, ideally you get to know your beat well. You get to know your people, the, the people in your community, whether it, you know, be the, the, the regulars that you interact with for, you know, for various behavioral or other issues or just the community members, um, you know, so you know, we're hoping to not be relegated to essentially being law enforcement, um, you know, firemen or law enforcement firefighters where we're just uh, being called out to deal with, you know, big incidents and no longer having the normalcy of being a part of the community. While we're on drunken driving, I've got to ask these questions. I know I'll get a no. Is there a quota for tickets in town? People have always felt that, that you guys are raising money for the city budget. Absolutely not. Most of us don't write very many tickets. I mean... It's more warnings than anything. Yeah, I mean, the goal is education and visibility. You know, what, what, are, what better way to change people's behavior than to, you know, have a police vehicle stop with lights on the side of the road in an area where there's a lot of complaints about speeding. Um, you know, that, you know, it, you know it, it's... It's just the best way to change someone's behavior, and, and perhaps you may stop someone who, you know, you, you try to talk to them about it and have a conversation like, hey, you know, we get a lot of complaints from folks who live in this area, um, you know, about speeding. You know, just, just be great if you could slow it down and pay a little more attention to the, the speed limit, and somebody, you know, may not respond to that. Now know, we track they, that interaction uh, so that we know whether people are driving while black, well, people are being pulled over for driving while black. I mean, every interaction in that, of that respect is tracked anyway. So basically, if I stop a car, an incident is created, and all the information from the location and date and time to the vehicle involved to the people involved is all documented. And now we're required initially as a agency policy, but now as a state law, I believe, to track race data. Um, but there's, especially at night, there's pretty much an impossibility to identify who's in the vehicle before you stop them. Um, You're stopping a vehicle for an infraction. Or, or it happens so quickly that you don't have time to sort of see who's in there. 
but again, in a, in a homogenous state like Vermont, I mean, even stopping one or two people of color can really essentially skew the numbers for, um, for uh, the data. I want to go to an uncomfortable topic, rape. What happens when someone calls and she tells the 911 person, I've been raped? What's the procedure? Um, so initially, I mean, they would take the person's information and, and ascertain you know, where they are. Um, you know, are they at the hospital um, getting treated? Are they at home? When did it occur? Did it just occur? Did it, you know, is, it, is, it, is it late reported, so to speak? Um, and then depending on the time of day, uh, if it were at night, then an officer would respond, whether they're at the hospital or elsewhere, would respond and take their initial statement, collect any evidence, such as clothing, um, request that the hospital do what's called a SANE kit. What is it? What is the SANE kit? A SANE is a sex assault nurse examiner, I believe is the acronym. But it's essentially a, a, a specially certified nurse um, or, or, or medical personnel um, who are trained to take samples um, from the person of the, of the person who is assaulted, just basically to collect any DNA or other things that would be present um, as quickly as possible because that's something that can be, um, that will deteriorate over time. Um, and so that initial responding officer would take their statement, get as much information about the circumstances and the basics at the beginning, um, and then and collect as much evidence so that that is available for the investigation and for any sort of testing or evidentiary uh, evaluation down the road. Um, and then we have one of our detectives is part of the uh, Washington County um, SIU, which is the Special Investigations Unit that is specifically um, Specifically, specifically focused on, on crimes of a, of a sexual nature, um, you know, kind of like Law and Order SVU, like that's a, a TV show based specifically on that type of investigation um, to, give it some, uh, to, give it, to give it some context. Um, and so our SVU investigator is one of our detectives, Matt Nisley, um, who has been doing it even back to when he was the school resource officer. So he has many years of experience, has gone to you know, a variety of trainings nationally, um, you know, because these are, you know, these are crimes of a, you know, not to quote the show, but crimes of a particularly heinous nature um, that are very, you know, of a very personal nature, and it's very difficult um, for some people to, you know, to talk about what happened to them. And so, having somebody who's well trained, who can help pull out the details that are necessary, and you know, has the um, experience and training necessary to take those cases all the way through to, ideally, you know, to prosecution. Um, you know, that's kind of the procedure. Initial, initial report is taken, referred to a detective, um, and then the investigation continues on. The, some evidence and other things may be evaluated. Um, DNA will be, you know, will taken and, and be compared to an existing database. And if there's any sort of um, a suspect involved, then a uh, what's called a TRO. Um, it's, a, it's a type of search warrant. Not t is it a TRO or NTO? I'm sorry. Yes, a non-testimonial order, which I, you know, it could go through judicial, judicial review of, of the facts of the case. A judge would determine that. There was probable cause to essentially take a DNA sample from a suspect in that case. Now we've had her speak, her in most cases, we've had her speak to Matt. Mm -hmm. Is there any sort of ancillary help that we routinely spread this to? Again, it could be a circle because frequently <coughs> it's someone they know or it could be a past partner or that type of situation for them to look for resources to maybe have a, an order in place that that person can't contact them in the future. It depends on if it's someone who's known or unknown also. But Circle is just one of those organizations that can provide resources, everything from housing to counseling. Safe um, house, different yeah. things like that. Just depending on the circumstances. And then there are other resources out there. Obviously, Washington County Mental Health is available for people to talk to. Um, but Circle is an organization that's you know, devoted to that to that area um, and has been you know, a, great, a great partner in, in helping people after the fact. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of times where our job kind of ends. Um, and that's something else that the Community Justice Center helps with is um, reaching out to victims of crime mm -hmm. and assessing sort of the impact on them with their, you know, even down to their uh, sort of opinions of how we handle things um, and if they need anything else, any other resources, you know, so we, we do get feedback from that, which is really helpful. Some people say, oh, you know, officer so-and-so was very helpful and did this or that. Or they say, oh, I, you know, I, something else came up and um, I really want to talk to an officer again. Um, so just, 
is a way that Community Justice Center reaches out and helps us kind of, you know, sort of follow up on something after, maybe after an incident is resolved or after a case goes to court. Would this be very similar in the case of a very serious assault or a murder? Would the family, the immediate family, their emotional needs be tended to? We can refer them to resources and frequently we'll see signs that someone is in need of something more and that's where we gather our resources and <coughs> We have a great resource called the Washington them. County Survival Guide, which mm -hmm. has been put together by I guess I think it's WCMH. Yep. As the is the main and it's this enormous I carry it. It, it folds, oh, yeah. yeah, we all we all carry them. I have it in my pocket right now, but it's this little folded piece of Tyvek actually, so it's waterproof. Um, that folds out and has a, it has a myriad of resources, everything from you know soup kitchens and sources for food and food shelves to counseling to crisis hotlines for a variety of excuse me for a variety of things. Um, you know, to numbers for police departments, numbers for um, you know medical and mental health resources. I mean, it's just a great resource to be to have. Um, you know, because it helps us refer people, but also it's something we can ha literally hand somebody and say. You know, you're, you're new in town, you know, you're living out of, you're living out of your car, you know, here's some resources for you. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, while we can't do everything for you, we can at least give you some options and maybe, you know, change your situation, help you change your situation so that, you know, we're not responding to whatever the situation may be. When a citizen feels that the police response hasn't been what they would term proper, what what can they do? What should they do? What's the procedure <coughs> if if I have a complaint against a police officer? I mean, so I guess there's different different levels. I mean, some, you know, sometimes people just want to call and speak to a supervisor and let their you know and be heard, um, but it can go all the way from that up to what's called a um, the form. So a form. It's a public. Um, I think it's a, a public review form. Basically, somebody can either use it to make a formal complaint or they can use it to make a, a formal commendation. I mean, a number of things. Uh, it, a formal complaint has been issued against a Montpelier mm -hmm. police officer. What's the chain of command that, that sees that complaint and adjudicates that? I mean, it, it would be taken initially by the supervisor on shift, um, and then it would go to our, you know, our administration, our captain and our chief for review, and they would open up an internal affairs investigation. Is there any point at, in which the city manager might become involved? Or is it strictly an internal police department issue? As far as I know, it's, it remains internal to the police department unless it becomes of a criminal nature um, or, you know, or a civil nature. And the police department will get back with the person who made the complaint? Absolutely. And there'll be a complete paper trail? Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything, to... everything would be in writing. They would receive a response in writing. What happens when, during one of those rare circumstances when there's a police shooting? What's the procedure then? I mean, I was involved in one myself, um, an incident at the high school with Nathan Giffen. Um, I mean, essentially, uh, from the officer's perspective, as soon as it occurs and the scene is safe, um, you know, the officer is immediately taken to the hospital and evaluated because obviously that's uh, typically evaluated very, in what way? Uh, just, just for I mean, because it's a very stressful, very traumatic situation, as I can attest to, um, and so. You know, you go to the hospital, and your your heart rate's up. You know, your your adrenaline's pumping. You know, your your mind's racing. Um, so just making sure that the officer, you know, is is, is healthy and is supported. Um, and then, uh, in my circumstance, I returned to the to the scene and was and everything was documented for evidence. Everything that I was wearing, the the weapon that was used, and so on, is taken into evidence. Um, and then I was put on administrative leave um, while the investigation was undergone. And at some point I met with the, the state police detectives from the major crimes unit who were investigating the, the incident, um, provided a statement, and then they were, made the report and the attorney general and the state's attorney made their um, determination as to whether it was just, essentially justified or whether criminal charges would be filed. Uh, so that's generally the, the procedure from my perspective from that situation. Um, but that kind of outlines how it works. You know, a, a shooting happens, officers generally placed on paid administrative leave. Um, different agencies have different policies regarding how long that is. I was you know, away for uh, 10 days or, or two weeks or so. Um, whereas the state police now has a policy where the officer is on, on administrative leave for the entirety of the investigation. 
obviously state police is a much larger agency with several hundred officers mm -hmm. versus Montpelier, which has 17. So, you know, whether it be the Giffen shooting or, or the uh, shooting on the Spring Street Bridge, um, you know, officers will be taken uh, out, of, out of service essentially for an extended period. But in order to function as an agency, um, you know, my, my situation, I was the only officer involved in the Mark Johnson shooting, there were two officers involved. And so again, you, you know, with a small agency, you start removing these people indefinitely from, from working. It makes it very difficult to provide um, police services to the town and staff and staff uh, regular shifts. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, essentially the state police does their investigation um, and that information is put to the attorney general and the local state's attorney to, again, like I said, evaluate for whether it, whether it met the, the criteria for a justified shooting or if um, criminal charges will be filed against the officer. Now, I don't believe that Montpelier requested military, surplus military equipment. Do you guys feel the need for our town to have surplus military equipment? <clears throat> Generally, I no. I mean, the only circumstance where, I mean, there have been situations where the state police's tactical unit has brought their armored vehicle to town. There was a situation adjacent to Hubbard Park uh, with the suicidal uh, male who, um, there's a lot of social media um, posts by him uh, with firearms and such, so, they, so we played it very safe. Um, and so the tactical unit responded and created a perimeter and then they used the armored vehicle to approach the, 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 you know, the person's vehicle safely um, and to be able to deploy some less lethal measures to drive him out of the vehicle and then take him into custody um, in a safe manner. And that is something that I think would have changed the outcome of uh, the Nathan Giffen shooting, because he was in the middle of a football field in the middle of winter, you know, with no, you know, with a with a firearm, with if, no. If I remember correctly, wasn't that on call and just didn't what didn't yeah, arrive on time? Yeah, it didn't arrive in time by the time you know the the, the shooting occurred. So it was you know it, either we'd ask for more time or for, you know, for that vehicle to have been closer and present because if it had been there, then the officers who initially couldn't, you know, couldn't approach across an open field safely without having to worry about, you know, getting shot at or get shot, um, would be able to approach it, him, would be able to approach that person safely, you know, and be able to communicate better. At that point, you know, Matt Nisley was a school resource, officer, school resource officer. He was at the high school when that happened, was the first to arrive on scene and essentially, um, you know, stop, stop Mr. Giffen in the, on the football field. And he continued, he's a trained, uh, a trained crisis negotiator continued to communicate with them for over, almost an hour, you know, in the bitter cold um, from across a field, which is kind of difficult. Um, whereas an armored vehicle would have allowed officers to approach, communicate better, but also deploy some less lethal options as well that were, that he was well out of the range of at, for what we had at the time. One final question. How would you like youth, small youth, to perceive the police, you, you individually as police officers? How would you like to see small children perceiving police? Diane? As someone they could approach for any reason at all, a question or help or any reason at all, a approachability, someone they could approach for any reason. You know, one of the most frustrating things that we see is when kids' parents, you know, you know, whether we're working you know, an event like July 3rd or something, there's a lot of people who are out on foot patrol or bike patrol um, interacting with the public and you, know, you walk by somebody and they say oh there's a police officer make sure you do this or that so that they don't take you to jail <laughs> like that type of thing drives us crazy because it's, it's essentially instead of you know again normal, normalizing our relationship with you know young people with your child and you know we, like Diane said we'd, we want them we want us to be somebody that they'll run to if they need help not somebody they'll be afraid of that will take them to jail because they didn't whatever eat their the circumstances <laughs> are, huh? Someone who would take them to jail because they didn't eat their dinner. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, part of that's on, on parents and, and, and now on society and what's going on um, yeah. around the country now. You know, I think that's going to be a very challenging thing to, to accomplish. But again, we want ourselves to be something that pe somebody that people will come to because they need help, wherever that may be. As we've indicated during this conversation, you know, we are a clearinghouse of information and resources, whether that be mental health, um, you know, uh, substance abuse. You know, we have a program through the department called Project Safe Catch. What is Project Safe Catch? It's, it's essentially like a, diver a diversionary program where instead of arresting you for possession of drugs, 
we'll, you know, we, we will take you immediately into treatment. So, you know, if we interact with somebody, um, you know, a circumstance where maybe somebody is passed out in a vehicle because they just used intravenous drugs like heroin, um, they overdose. And then, you know, maybe that scares them enough to be like, I need help. I want help. Um, we can, we have this, we already immediately have a program in place to say, Hey, we have this program called Project Safe Catch. You know, you just you know, give us any paraphernalia, give us anything you have on you, just so that you know that you're safe and that uh, wherever we take you will be safe. Um, no charges, nothing will be filed. You know, you're not in any trouble. We'll take you immediately to treatment where you will be. You know, a bed will be found for you where you can go into inpatient treatment and, and essentially be taken out of the circumstances and environment that uh, where you were using and. Be put into a, an environment of, of care and uh, and recovery, hopefully. So it sort of takes the you know it's the care it's a carrot you know versus versus the stick that isn't, has been you know a great just like any of any number of other resources that we have where we can divert somebody and not have be in conflict with them. Um, it's just a great resource to offer to somebody who's whether they're in crisis or in in a situation where they're addicted to a, a substance. Can a neighbor who doesn't have documents, who's in the country illegally, call the police and report the same kinds of things that my wife and I would report and not fear being <coughs> reported? Absolutely. Absolutely. We have a policy in place for the department that prevents us from asking the immigration status of anybody mm -hmm. that we interact with. Um, it prohibits us from interacting with immigration uh, officials in anything but the most extreme circumstances. And in 10 years of me doing this job, I, we've never interacted with ICE. Same in the schools? Yep, absolutely. The goal behind that being that, again, these are people who are here in our community, you know, and if they're afraid of getting in trouble for just because of their status, then, think, then they're, you know, they're... Vulnerable. They're very vulnerable. They're going to be easily victimized with no, no chance for help or, or, or justice. So... That's the goal of that, and it's it's a, you know there are other populations that have similar problems. You know, it's it, it goes hand in hand with the safe catch safe catch issue. People will be afraid to say, "Oh, my friend's overdosing, and they need to get them help." I'm afraid to call for help because the police will show up and we'll all get in trouble. No, I mean there's a law in place, um, a Samaritan Samaritan law that um, prevents police from from taking action against somebody who calls to help somebody in that in that. that so someone's called, said, "My friend's overdosed." You, you rush in, you see drug paraphernalia out in the open. What happens to the, everybody in there? I mean, essentially, we'll essentially ignore it unless it's, you know, something of a, a ridiculous nature, but, you know, piles and piles of, of a certain, you know, of, of narcotics. For sale. Something. Yeah. Is what but again, the, in the, you know, with individual usage and with every, every scene I've gone to with an overdose, um, you know, it's, it's a needle it's, on the yeah maybe sink. a needle on the mm -hmm. on the on the you know on the on the the counter or you know in the bedroom or whatever um, it's usually really minimal amounts of of the drug and minimal amounts of paraphernalia um, and you know again we're there simply because a lot of times when somebody is brought back when they administer naloxone or narcan sometimes they can come back you know be, be very violent violent or resistive to the medical personnel who are helping them. So we're just there. Usually we're just there just to make sure everybody's safe. And as soon as they're back and they're cooperative and, and are um, loaded on the ambulance, then you know, there's a lot of situations where we are, we'll stand on the periphery and we'll leave as soon as um, we know that everybody's safe. So I assume that when we're talking about adults, you guys aren't driving down the streets checking to see if there's four marijuana plants in a person's backyard instead of three? It's just never really <laughs> been a priority. You know, I mean, as I alluded to earlier, alcohol is a much much more challenging drug Definitely. than marijuana will ever be. And it's just not a priority for all law enforcement, you know, in Vermont generally, but for our agency especially. Um, you know, if we go into someone's home for another reason and we see you have plants, I, I doubt that an officer's really going to be too concerned unless, you know, there's some enormous grow operation going on. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that's not, you know, it's a, more of a civil issue than a, a criminal issue. Realizing that we're not in an engaging mood. I'm sitting triangulating from you without the mask and you don't have masks because you're safely distanced. Are people engaging you on Black Lives Matter and on policing vis-a-vis -vis people of color? Are, are you on your level hearing the community weigh in on that? Uh, 
I hear a lot of people come up to me if I'm walking down the street or if I'm stopped at a light who just kind of wave and say, hey, I just want you to know I live in Montpelier and I support the police department. It must be really hard for you to be policing right now. That's the, the general feel I'm getting from the community. Yeah, I mean, it's, we've gotten some great support in that respect, um, but we also are having good conversations a lot of the time. Maybe not so good. I mean, uh, you know, there, there's a rally early on, not the most recent one, but there's one early on for Black Lives Matter at the State House lawn. Um, you know, and we provided traffic control and shut down the street and so on, traffic and crowd control. We're essentially on the perimeter, out of, out of the way, not really engaging. But, you know, there are a lot of people walking by with signs that say, you know, all cops are bastards and, and you know, some are quite F12 and, yeah. um, you know, defund the police and all these things, you know, that just don't feel very productive. Um, you know, I can certainly understand the defund aspect once you delve into that and understand that it's not just about, you know, removing the police altogether or, or, or what have you. Um, but there's just a lot of, that's some of the most open hostility that I've experienced as a police officer, generally. How do we bridge that gap besides doing television shows like this to get people to more understand what policing's about in our, our community and the ground level? Meeting your police officers, getting to know the police officers in your community. It, I, I feel like each police department is its own... Its own culture, its own family. That goes with its community. Right. It's, we, think, they can differ from I think town we, to town. We've tried very hard, and that's one of the frustrating things with what's going on, is that we've tried so hard over the years to, to listen to the community and, and adopt progressive policies and be, be respectful and be as sort of hands off as we can be because that's what people want. You know, people don't want an overly aggressive department. People don't want ticket quotas and marijuana arrests and, and things like that. People want us to be reasonable and approachable and to be there when they need us and to help regardless of what the, the problem is. Um, are you starting to get a feel for Brian's culture, uh, your new police chief, sure. rather than um, Chief Fakos's culture? I mean, Brian, you know, Brian, Chief Pete is is very, very energetic, very intelligent, very uh, educated, um, and his perspective comes from, um, you know, he's basically been um, doing what was, I guess, called an Inspector General in Chicago, and I think also in the Air Force, but he's essentially policing the police. I mean, that's what he's done in his career. And so, you know, well, he's very supportive of us individually as officers. He has a master's in um, psychology. Um, so he understands, you know, how we think, how the community thinks, how people think and work. Um, and that's been very helpful. I think he's going to be just a, a you know, a force in his, in his own right um, for interaction, communication, understanding. Because as you alluded to earlier, it's, that's what it is. Like, Yes, we need to have conversations with anybody who's critical of us. We need to have conversations with people um, who feel marginalized, you know, people of color um, and other populations. Um, you know, it's not always easy because sometimes it's in the midst of when we're working or we're on a call, we're on a call um, which is why we need to create, which we did, we have in the past with events like Coffee with a Cop, mm -hmm. and Chief Pete has continued to do. He's been doing um, virtual um, town hall meetings, um, he's been doing some in-person meetings on the State House lawn to try to elicit feedback from the community kind of in that, um, you know, in a, in a neutral, um, open environment that's not, you know, us in the middle of dealing with some incident, you know, and has having somebody walk up and, and start wanting to have to, you know, to either aggressively criticize or just have a conversation. Um, you know, that's, that's important. That's, that's also on us. You know, we need to create those circumstances, which the current pandemic is not allowed for, and that's, again, been a big frustration. Dan, what are your impressions of the new police chief? Uh, he right away made sure that he made time for each of us on staff to be able to speak with him, which was an incredible opportunity. It was really nice to be able to get to meet him and talk to him one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, <coughs> I think he's very energetic and um, community-oriented, He's very into having questions answered right away, right from the get-go, as soon as he showed up here. So, definitely supportive. I want to thank both of you for your time, and I'd like to say for your service, your police service, although I've known both of you forever. 
Um, and I want to thank you for watching this show. I, I hope that you'll watch the other shows because all of them on the reopening are, are interesting in their own ways. Uh, especially watch the one with Chief Pete and Chief Fakos because that's the compliment show to this one. Uh, get out and vote on August 11th in the primary. That's important. And uh, watch the other shows on Orca's YouTube channel, Orca Media YouTube. Thank you so very much. What you just watched was an hour and 10 minutes. And Orca likes their shows either an hour or an hour and a half. And I couldn't find 10 minutes that I like to take out. So what we did was we added 20 minutes. And since we were talking about Chief Pete, I thought we would borrow some footage from the show that we shot with Chief Fakos and Chief Pete on Tony's last day as an introduction to Chief Brian Pete so you get some sense of who the chief is and what his priorities are. And so we're just going to do some cuts from that and they'll fade in, they'll fade out. But I would encourage you to watch the broader show, the one with Chief Fakos and Chief Pete. It's found on Orca Media on the YouTube channel where you're likely watching this because it's well worth watching. It gives you the broad overview of the policing that Mike and Diane are doing every day. So we'll go here to our new police chief, Chief Brian Pete. Welcome to Montpelier. Thank you very much. It's an honor and a privilege, uh, privilege to be here. How did police chief, where was he born and how did he get into policing? Um, well, I was- Speaking of you in the third person. <laughs> I was born in uh, Chicago on the south side. Um, and uh, uh, policing is, it, it kind of turned into a family business, if you will. My, both of my parents joined the Chicago Police Department later on in their lives and in their careers. And um, so as I was going through, you know, graduating through grammar school and then and on to high school is when my parents started coming into the law enforcement fold. Um, and then seeing what they were doing was, was extremely interesting. So I ended up getting uh, graduating from college and getting a commission in the Air Force and uh, started off in aircraft maintenance. And um, but that pull towards law enforcement was 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 really attractive and strong for me. So I ended up going into uh, the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. And then after doing um, five years, roughly five years there, that's when I came back, uh, left the Air Force and came back to Chicago and then joined the Chicago Police Department. Was your brother on the force at that time? Uh, no, not at the time. I was the third and then my brother uh, came a little, a few years after. What, Chicago seems like such a different world than Montpelier. First of all, on the south side of Chicago, is that uh, White Sox or Cubs territory? White Sox territory. My wife is a Cubs fan, so uh, that I had to, to eat that one when we first met. This is a very beautiful, smart, intelligent woman, and I want to get to know her. So I had to make certain sacrifices, and since she was a Cub fan, um, I had to go to a Cub game. That was the first, and uh, hopefully the last time I'll ever go to a Chicago Cubs. I didn't say that in jest. The Cubs are a great team, but I'm a White Sox person. What is the south side of Chicago? I mean, how many people live there? Uh, what? Oh, lots. Uh, south side is, uh, and it's, you know, right now, because of what's going on in, in life and everything that, that's happening within Chicago, um, when you say south side, it's always synonymous with, with violence. Uh, but there are, speaking very honestly and frankly, the entire city is gentrified. So you have uh, different color, uh, colors, backgrounds, ethnicities, uh, even religions uh, that, are, that are concentrated in certain areas, um, and, and as well as socioeconomic status. But within the South Side, there are pockets everywhere within it. So um, you could literally cross one side of the tracks and everything's great. <laughs> you cross back over to the other side of the tracks, uh, things may not be so great. Uh, so um, it, it's just, there's a lot going on. Were you there. assigned to your own neighborhood as Tony uh, was working his own neighborhood? <laughs> no, in, uh, in, chi in Chicago, um, it's everything's based on seniority. So um, when I got out of the academy, didn't matter how old I was, didn't matter what experiences I had, it's low, pers low, low person who just got in, newest person, you're going to nights and you're going into the areas that we need manning at. So I ended up going to the west side now, what um, is the west Chicago. side of Chicago like? It's another one of those places when you Google it and they say the, the, the here where a lot of the concentrated uh, acts of violence happen, unfortunately. So they tend to be at the uh, south and the west sides. And I was in the 11th district in one of the more um, uh, busiest districts within the city limits. Now, the 11th district, 
How many police were assigned to the, more than 18 probably? Uh, yeah, we roughly would, if we were lucky due to demanding issues, we would have 18, oh, not even that many on, on one particular shift. So there, there are literally hundreds. Chicago's a department of, uh, on paper, depends on who you talk to, but 13 to, uh, 13, five, uh, sworn officers for the department. 13,500. Yes. Uh, so you're sitting in a precinct, I would imagine, that's bigger than our police department. Yes, but, and I'll also say to that is, uh, I think there are pros and cons with everything, but I think smaller uh, agencies have a more, I think have more challenges, uh, have, have a different set of challenges that larger uh, departments do not have. And to me, they're, because they're so personable, they're a lot more difficult, in my humble opinion. How so? Well, you can get lost in the crowd in Chicago. You can get lost, you can just be just another officer, you can kind of just ride things the way they are. You come to a smaller community, you can't get lost. There are expectations, there are, uh, take, take Montpelier, for example. There's a culture here in law enforcement, and there are expectations. And when these discussions happen amongst supervisors, amongst leaders, um, you, you have to adapt to that culture. You have to understand what those expectations are and you have to, to, to act on them uh, uh, pro progressively and, um, and, uh, and assertive. In this town, this is a town of 7,500 people and a lot of us do know everyone who's in that car. You know, uh, and if I didn't stop, my wife would kill me. Well, see, true, and that too, but you know what else? The other thing is, if you don't have trust, and the only person who's stopping you or who's keeping you from stopping the car is yourself. And if you don't believe in legitimacy or, or the authority, if you will, or you don't observe that with the police officer behind you, you're just gonna keep going. So to avoid those types of things, we wanna make sure that we earn the trust of the people so that they know us so when they're pulling us over or so if we unfortunately have to pull someone over for something like that, they understand that the person who is working is a professional values their dignity and honors and respects them. That's what legitimacy is, I think. Have we had a problem with that in the past, Tony? Oh, yeah. You know, it, it's, uh, I wouldn't say, you know, it, it's in pockets. It's, it could be in, in various groups. Um, sometimes even when it's outside, external influence, uh, you know, outside of my pillar, um, yeah, they, they can be problematic. And, and if I could tag sure. on to, to what Tony had mentioned, uh, there is, a, in, in the the most recent city council meeting, uh, there was an individual who, who had expressed a little bit of frustration and, and wanting to know what the council's thoughts on um, defunding, reducing uh, 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 the budget for the police department, abolishing the police department in its entirety. And uh, it, it's a difficult spot for them to be in. And I wanna put my hats off to them because the fact that they didn't come right out and, and, and give an opinion one way or the other, to me says that they're taking their responsibilities extremely serious by looking at listening, absorbing, doing what they're supposed to do as elected officials and hearing from the constituency and then holding the department accountable and asking the department questions to see where it's gonna go or just before they make their decision. So to me, it's an informed decision and um, it's easy to get weighed into that type of politics, but I think doing it recklessly is destructive and they have not done that. So I'm extremely, um, it, it's a hard job. It's not an easy job that they have. How many stops do we make approximately a year? How many traffic violations? If we're full staff, we'll, we'll probably stop you know, upwards of uh, 3,000 vehicles, maybe 3,500. In the town of 7,500. Yeah, but that's, that's, that's residential population. Right. You know, the roads, that is true. You know, who, when you look at our, who's on our roads and, and We have three the volume, we have two. Right, so I mean, it, you know, at any given time, estimations of, of people in Montpelier can be well in excess of 20,000 people by day. Are we seeing any racial disparities in those numbers? We, we have not in Montpelier. And if I also may add on to that, while we do have to look at data-driven approaches and intelligence-led policing approaches, we have to make sure we apply the correct lens to filter it out. So you can um, um, look at that type of data and see what type of populations are being stopped by, by uh, law enforcement. But you also have to remember that if we pull over, say if, if you're having a, a, if you're looking at a certain time frame and if 10 cars are pulled over and two happen to be 
uh, people of color or, or five happen to be female or male, then, then there's a skew to that data. So, so automatically you've looked at, you know, if, if by the, just by being there, four people are pulled over and they happen to be people of color. Then you're going to, then it could, then the numbers could be made to look like that, well, we're disproportionately targeting people of color when in actuality it's just who we're stopping at what times we're stopping. So you have to make sure that you have a correct filter when you do this, um, that you take everything into context. But um, uh, while not uh, ignoring what that could be, I mean, because if that's become something that we, we're constantly seeing, th then that deserves a, a, an in depth conversation with, within the department and within the community itself. Now, Chief Pete, you are going to inherit, if I'm right, Tony, tell me if I'm right, I might be wrong, uh, the state is going to be requiring body cams? Yes. So you are going to inherit a requirement for body cams. How do you feel about that? Uh, every police chief that I have met in my career and all the studies and research that I've done, uh, see, Tony, if I can back up really quick to 21st century police, Tony was there, been there, done that, he got the t-shirt. I was studying people like Tony uh, and moving forward in my, in my career. So, but um, every police chief, I don't think there's one out there. Um, if, there if there is, their time's probably up as far as how this profession's going, but Every police chief wants access to body-worn cameras because it helps more. It, it, it de-escalates situations. It improves accountability. Now, it's not the end-all, be-all, but it's another tool to add. And uh, so it's just, uh, but the problem with that is, is where you get the money. And so you can well, the buy. The state has said that, you know, <laughs> I presume the state will significantly carry this load. Uh, that's to be determined. They will. Uh, they're already talking about for the public, Department of Public Safety exactly. for FY22. We're actually more hoping something comes out of Congress um, and some federal funds uh, that, could, that could certainly uh, uh, help springboard us in that direction. Yeah, because we don't envy the state because we understand the state's predicament too. It's even with the right. cities, COVID-19. So there's a huge funding lag or, or, lap, or uh, falls, uh, shortages. So uh, it's, you know, we're coming into a time that, uh, that there's a lot more accountability being demanded and you do that and technology was one of the other pillars of policing. Chief Pete, on the same topic? I, I'd echo everything that Tony said, that um, uh, from, from me being here, it's the a limited amount of time that I've been here, there is a true culture within the Montpelier Police Department of helping as much as possible, not just the people we serve or each other, but it's, it's our fellow, it's, it's our peer law enforcement agency. So there, there is a strong desire within the department itself to do everything that we can to get on board and, and to, uh, to, to look at regional models and to, to give the limited resources that we have, combine them with others and move forward for a stronger um, uh, way to service uh, our communities. Now one thing that you posted on an extensive Facebook that went around that posting and in that you mentioned um, different communities that the police will be dealing with, uh, including ethnic minorities, uh, but also those with mental health issues. Can you two elaborate on the relationship between mental health issues and 21st century policing and community policing? Uh, I can, I can, I'll give a quick 30,000 uh, foot view of overview that um, where we've come now, we can look at the history of it, and there, there's a lot of sociology in there um, and, and economics in there. But where we're at now is to the point that law enforcement agencies become the default call for a lot of things that require social service function. So whether it's going to be um, shelter, whether it's going to be crisis situations, whether it's going to be, uh, you, you name it, uh, someone complaining that this person's not wearing a face mask, it's going to be law enforcement's the default call. That's just where we're at now. And um, police leaders for years now have been asking for to have dialogues to talk about what is appropriate and what's not appropriate for law enforcement agencies to, to respond to. But in the meantime, the argument could be there that we're slow at doing it. Um, it's a legitimate conversation to have. But law enforcement agencies have been working to try to, uh, to try to get past these challenges that we've had. So if you look at something like CIT or crisis intervention training, or what Montpelier did was took that, that concept 
and they localize it based on the needs and based on the resources that they have here, which is called Team 2. So it, it, we're still finding, we're, we're still, it's incumbent upon us to find ways to do these things, to answer these calls in safe manners, and we're working our hardest to do that. Um, law enforcement agencies partnering with uh, folks who do uh, domestic violence crisis on a daily basis, partnering with, uh, with those organizations and learning from them. So like, for example, one of the newest things that we're talking about in law enforcement uh, community is that you look at the eyes. You look to see if there's evidence of strangulation because we know now what strangulation can cause strokes, it can cause a lot of different problems. So the things that we're learning from our partners in domestic violence uh, that we apply towards the investigative avenue, but also in looking at how domestic violence tends to play out, the cycle of violence, and where law enforcement can come in and handle the situation um, with respect and understanding and empathy of what it is, you know. So um, the more that we know about all the calls that we're dealing with, the better we can respond and serve the people we're sworn to protect. Um, there's a national dialogue right now to uh, pretty much tear up anything that's related to a police department. Um, and I think that's, uh, I understand the emotion behind the, the conversation, but I think that's unfortunate. Um, uh, things that we've done as a profession, unitedly as a profession. Um, and, um, but we have to remember the good of the situation. And um, so I look at an SRO as, uh, as the opportunity for, you can't, we're all dealing with limited resources. You can't catch everything all the time. So my question to folks um, that are considering something like pulling an SRO would be, how many layers of safety do you want for your children? And uh, teachers aren't going to catch everything. School counselors aren't going to catch everything. Um, it's unfortunate because there's a lot going on. But you have one more insular layer of somebody who cares and somebody who wants to be there and somebody who wants to, 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 um, to help children, to help our kids. And I think um, as long as we understand and we have clearly defined roles and actions of what it is that we're supposed to be doing within law enforcement, within a school counselor, within the teachers, within the administration itself, you have a you could have a very robust system, and in here in Montpelier, the system's working, and uh, so I think we just need to make sure that we we stay cognizant of it and we stay on top of what it is our training needs to be, and what it is that we um, as a collective team, as all stakeholders who care about the safety of our children, um, are, are uh, needing to do to move forward. You know, taking a step back, and once we kind of see where. Uh, you know, Montpelier wants to go financially and priori priority-wise, uh, where the legislature is going, where Congress is going with a lot of police reform, and and how um, it's a very strong department and we have strong community support, uh, but it's going to be navigating what is the outcome of those. Please, please, Chief Pete, I want to ask one: What can my wife and I and the rest of Montpelier do for you? Um. You've done everything. People of this community have already done it. It's um, my wife, Natalie, my daughter, Gabriella. We feel so welcome here. And um, it's not, a, uh, it's not a, a, a facade. It's actual real. There's a sincerity here that just that brings a sense of peace. Um, and we're, we're just enjoying our time here. And the only thing we could ask for is uh, me personally, professionally, uh, would be just um, let me know when I'm doing wrong. Let me know when I'm doing right so I can continue to, uh, to uh, serve because I take that oath extraordinarily seriously. And um, thank you so very much. Have a good evening.